Hello, my name is Kadeen Mohammed, Thermal Analysis Product Manager at TA Instruments. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you get disconnected at any time, please follow the instructions to log back in. You can access helpful links in the documents widget below. Please ask any questions you may have at any moment through the Q&A window, and we will do our best to answer them. Today, Dr. Gray Slough, who has over 20 years of technical experience at TA Instruments, will present the utility of hyphenating the thermogravimetric analyzer with spectroscopy techniques, specifically with FTIR, MS, and GCMS. TGA measures weight stability of a material with respect to temperature, time, and atmosphere. This weight change can either be an increase associated with processes such as sorption or oxidation, or loss associated with desorption, desalvation, sublimation, or decomposition. However, the TGA on its own does not chemically identify the off-gases being released from your sample. Do you need to know if there is residual solvent in your material? TGA hyphenated with FTIR or mass spectrometry can resolve whether that volatile content is water vapor or an organic solvent. Do you need to understand the degradation pathways of a material as it is heated ballistically, or to determine if degradation products are being created as a high-performing plastic is held at its continuous surface temperature? Combining the TGA with spectroscopy is a powerful approach in providing insights into materials characterization. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gray. Thanks, Gray. Thanks, Kadeem. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this TA Instruments webinar, the subject of which is the hyphenation of thermogravimetric instruments with infrared spectrometers, mass spectrometers, and GCMS instruments. This talk will highlight the importance and the utility of hyphenating TGA instruments with these spectrometers. So first, let's talk about the motivation for hyphenation. So in a typical TGA experiment, we know that a sample is heated at a controlled rate from some initial temperature to some final temperature. And typically, gases are evolved from the sample they exit the TGA, and in the vast majority of cases, these gases are drawn from the TGA and exited perhaps through the roof of the building. So this represents information that's lost. Information that could be used to study solvent uh, uh, release from a material, to study uh, possible contamination of a material, or to do reverse engineering of a material. So the idea behind hyphenating a TGA with a spectrometer is to then take those off gases and do some type of chemical analysis on them, which could tell us something about perhaps the chemical nature of the, of the sample or the particular degradation process that is occurring uh, as the sample is heated or potentially reaction products uh, within the, the sample. Uh, typically, this type of hyphenation just requires a heated transfer line which is attached to the TGA on one end and to the spectrometer on the other end. Uh, this heated transfer line is, is heated to such a temperature as to keep the gases in the gaseous state as they proceed from the, the TGA uh, to the spectrometer. So first off, right off the bat, a question that, that obviously arises is, um, uh, is there a better spectrometer? Today we're going to focus on infrared spectrometers and mass spectrometers. And my experience is that between these two spectrometers, neither one is superior to the other. Both will give excellent information about the chemical nature of the gases that are introduced into them. However, when you then start to talk about GCMS, there is a consideration that comes into play between these standalone instruments and a GCMS type of instrument. And that consideration is the idea of continuous versus non-continuous um, spectra collection. So with the standalone uh, spectra uh, instruments, the, the IR spectra, uh, spectrums and the, um, the mass spectrometers, uh, there's the possibility to collect a spectrum continuously over time. So as the, the TGA is ramping, the sample, 
uh, you're collecting spectra during that entire time, and you can then um, associate uh, a particular spectra, uh, hopefully with uh, a potential mass loss event that occurs within the TGA. <coughs> Excuse me. In a GCMS system, on the other hand, that is a non-continuous system. Uh, so typically, you have to choose a single point in time to capture a spectrum. And so what this ultimately means is if, you, if you're running a sample in the TGA that has multiple weight loss events occurring, uh, you're typically going to have to set up several GCMS experiments. So you're going to end up with a, a lot of time consumed to, um, to collect the data. We'll see that GCMS will give perhaps the most chemical information uh, available, the most chemical analysis of the gases entering into it, but the drawback is some of the time that, that has to be um, invested in terms of getting this information. Another thing that we should talk about is what types of off gases are typically being sent into these spectrometers. Uh, in, in some cases, it's going to be a a gas or vapor of a substance which is actually under investigation within the TGA itself. A good example here is um, materials that have water or solvent absorbed into them. Uh, typically at some low temperature they will be desorbed from, from the material and these will be transferred to the spectrometer without further degradation and so the spectrometer will be able to analyze them as complete molecules. In some instances, you're going to be looking at reaction products uh, from gases that are, are uh, evolved from your sample. And this is more of a consideration if you're running with some type of active purge gas rather than an inert purge gas. Uh, again, a good example here would be many polymers, when they decompose, they will leave a carbon residue uh, at the bottom of the pan. PET is a, a good example of this. Uh, if you then uh, introduce oxygen or air into the system at high temperature, uh, that oxygen or air will interact with this carbon residue to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. And so those are the actual chemical species which will then be analyzed by the spectrometer. Uh, and then sometimes, uh, in fact most of the time, really what you're going to be looking at is degradation products of the sample under investigation. So it's not really that your sample is going to go from its solid state to its gaseous state, but it's going to break apart as heated into smaller molecular units, and then those units are what's going to be analyzed by the, um, by the spectrometers. So let's first start off and talk about infrared spectrometry. So in an infrared spectrometer, gases come into the spectrometer and they interact with infrared radiation. There is, a, uh, there is an IR source within the spectrometer and the gases then are irradiated with uh, the radiation coming from this IR source. And this IR source is, um, uh, uh, will give off a, a, a range of frequencies with it. Now we know that infrared radiation is of such an energy that it will excite uh, vibration and rotation modes in molecules. Uh, also, uh, we also know that, that molecules are only going to absorb specific frequencies of infrared radiation. So that's what allows us to do the spectroscopy. Now, older spectrometers, when, when infrared spectrometry was first uh, being uh, developed, uh, the spectrometers would have to scan from an initial frequency to a final frequency and they would have to do that sequentially. So it was a rather time-consuming process to get a spectrum. Modern instruments today are built uh, with an interferometer on the inside. Uh, and we don't go into details in this talk, but suffice it to say the use of an interferometer reduces the amount of time quite significantly to which is needed to scan over the frequency range of interest. Um, and then a Fourier transfer routine is usually used to, to deconvolute the, the data, which is presented as an interferogram. Uh, and the Fourier transform is then used to deconvolute this interferogram to produce the spectrum. And the bottom uh, piece of data that's shown in this slide here 
is uh, a infrared spectrum. It's a plot of absorbance on the y-axis and wave number, inverse centimeters, on the x-axis. The range here is from 400 to 4,000 inverse centimeters. That's the mid-IR range. And we see that the spectrum is a continuous plot of absorbance at various wavelengths. And we get a set of peaks which are indicative of molecule or molecules absorbing infrared radiation at those wavelengths. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of FTIR? Well, as alluded to previously, it is a continuous method. Uh, there's also easy spectral subtraction. So typically when you start an FTIR experiment, uh, there's always a scan taken with the furnace closed and no sample in the TGA. And then this collected piece of data is used to subsequently sub, uh, do a background subtraction from subsequent uh, uh, collected spectra. Uh, library searches are straightforward. Uh, the libraries are built into the software. Um, and in some cases, deconvolution is possible. So here at TA, uh, we have a thermonicolae uh, infrared spectrometer in our lab. And part of the software is, can be used to to if you believe that, that the spectrum that you're collecting potentially might be an overlay uh, or multiple spectra, this software can be used to deconvolute it. We're going to talk more about this point in a couple of slides. One of the disadvantages, and it is a minor disadvantage, is that gases which lack a dipole moment are not, uh, do not interact with infrared radiation. So you won't see those gases at all uh, in the infrared spectrometer. So this actually means that symmetric molecules like nitrogen and oxygen will pass through the spectrometer without interacting with the infrared radiation and without producing any type of spectrum. So we'll proceed right now to a piece of data and we're going to look at uh, a polymer called polyphenylene oxide. Uh, this is a engineering polymer. It has good high uh, uh, heat resistance and it has a good tensile strength. And we actually show the monomer unit uh, below. Uh, it's a ring structure with a couple of methyl groups and an oxygen uh, hanging off of the end of the ring structure. Uh, and the TGA uh, data here, uh, we show we're plotting the weight loss signal. We're plotting the derivative of the weight loss signal so that we can see where the maximum rate of weight loss is occurring. And by looking at the, the derivative signal, we see that there is mainly one significant weight loss which occurs in this material. There's a minor weight loss that occurs around 200, but the significant weight loss is occurring uh, between 450 and 500 Celsius, with the maximum rate of weight loss occurring at about 475 degrees Celsius. Also in this plot, we're showing a Gram-Schmidt plot. Now the Gram-Schmidt plot actually comes from the spectrometer. Um, and the Gram-Schmidt plot can be thought of as a total infrared signal, uh, the, the, essentially a total IR signal. So this type of data uh, can be brought into TRIO software. It can be overlaid with the, uh, the TGA data. And we can see that the, the maximum in the Gram-Schmidt plot here, so the point uh, in time and in this case also in temperature, where the Gram-Schmidt plot is indicating that the IR signal, the, the amount of interaction between the molecules with the infrared radiation is at a maximum, is almost at the same position uh, where the rate of weight loss is at a maximum. What this is telling us is that the gases are being transferred from the TGA to the infrared spectrometer uh, very efficiently. So, of course, the Gram-Schmidt plot, uh, at each point on the Gram-Schmidt plot, there is a spectrum uh, from the infrared spectrometer that's associated with that point. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the spectrum that's at the peak of the Gram-Schmidt plot. And that is the spectrum that's actually shown here. So again, this is a plot of absorbance versus wave number and it was collected right at the peak of the Gram-Schmidt plot, so this is where the IR signal was at a maximum. We can take this data now, and quite easily we can do a library search on it. So a click of a couple of buttons, and you can have 
the libraries loaded within the software present to you what they think is are the best matches uh, to the raw data. Uh, and in this case, the top match which comes back from the, the libraries is that uh, this, the raw spectrum is matched closest to 2,6-dimethylphenol. And we can see the structure of 2,6-dimethylphenol. And the structure of 2,6-dimethylphenol uh, is very close to the, uh, the monomer structure of the polyphenolin oxide. There's just an extra hydrogen that's, that's on it. So this structure actually makes a lot of sense in terms of being a potential part of the gas. We also see, though, that it's not a perfect match. There are several places where there are peaks within the raw spectrum where the library spectrum doesn't have an associated peak. So this is probably telling us that we have multiple components. We don't just have 2,6-dimethylphenol uh, being uh, uh, sent into the spectrometer, but we probably have some other types of gases, too. So this is actually a good point to talk about library searches. So as mentioned in the previous slide, when you do a library search, typically the library is presenting to you what it thinks is the single best match between the raw data that you've given it and the, the, the library structures that it has. Um, and as alluded to previously too, you can, you can have difficulties then if there are multiple gases coming into multiple different chemical species coming into the spectrometer, all with their own associated uh, spectra, because then those get overlaid on top of one another. Um, and so you're going to get a composite spectrum. Now, uh, it, it, so first of all, this doesn't relieve the, 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 the fact that you can do library search is very easy. Uh, that doesn't relieve the analytical chemist from, you know, critically analyzing the, uh, the results that are presented to them. So in this case, uh, the 2,6-dimethylphenol, the structure looks very similar to the monomer unit coming from the polyphenolin oxide. So it makes some sense. So that doesn't seem to be um, uh, uh, not an unreasonable match to the raw data. Um, now, the thermonicolay software has the potential to deconvolute spectra. So if you think that there potentially might be two, three, or four separate gas species that are being uh, analyzed by the spectrometer, uh, you can attempt to have the, uh, the thermal nicolay software do a deconvolution, deconvolution into a set of spectra from four different chemical species that when added together will produce the final raw uh, spectrum that you presented it. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate that software here because uh, there's a previous webinar that was done by um, Jim Brown here at TA Instruments and Mike Bradley from Thermo Nicolay, uh, in which Mike uh, does an excellent demonstration of this software and the capabilities of it. Uh, the link to, the, um, to this particular uh, webinar is shown at the bottom of the slide here. Okay, so now let's move on to mass spectrometry. Uh, so how a mass spectrometer works, in a, in a mass spectrometer, as the gases come in, they are first ionized, they then move through a filter, and then they strike a detector. And for mass spectrometers, there are typically multiple ways to do each of these steps here. So first of all, the ionization. For most benchtop mass spectrometers, which are going to be attached to TGA, that are going to be hyphenated to, to TGA instruments, by far the, the, the most common way of ionizing the gas is through electron impact ionization. In this case, uh, electrons are boiled off of a hot wire, uh, and typically it's tungsten and then they are accelerated to a kinetic energy of about 70 electron volts. Uh, I'll talk uh, later as to why 70 is, is, a, uh, is the common uh, kinetic energy that they're given. And then they will cross the path of the gas coming into the spectrometer, collide with the molecules, and essentially ionize the gas. So they'll either singly or multiply ionize the gas. Um, and then in this state, too, some molecules become very unstable, especially in multiple ionized states, and so they will tend to fragment those states, too. So you'll get not only ionized molecules, but you'll get fragments of molecules that then proceed through the filter. 
Uh, now, again, there are a number of ways to do mass filtering. Um, the most common way in a benchtop mass spectrometer is to use what's called a quadrupole filter. So as the name implies, quadrupole, uh, it's essentially four metal rods which are held at various DC and AC voltages. And these voltages then are scanned from some certain set of values, uh, initial values, to some final set of values. And in doing so, you hope that a single mass to charge species is going to pass through the filter at a specific set of voltages. And so this must be emphasized too, what's passing through the filter is a mass to charge species. So in other words, take carbon monoxide for instance. If you singly ionize it, uh, its mass to charge is going to be 28. Carbon 12, oxygen 16, together is 28. And so singly ionized mass to charge, if there's just one electron missing, uh, it has a mass to charge of 28. If you doubly ionize it though, the mass to charge is going to be 14. So what passes through the filter are specific mass to charge species. Uh, these species then when they make it through they strike the detector and the detectors are essentially uh, ammeters. They are measuring ion current, the amount of ion current that is passing through the filter at those settings. So then the, the types of data that you get then are represented in the graph below. It's going to be a graph of relative intensity or ion current versus now mass to charge. And in these benchtop mass spectrometers, we are looking at unit mass to charge. So you see that this is not a continuous set of data as it was in the IR spectrum, but it's more like a histogram of how much ion current is there at 18, how much ion current is there at 28. You can collect a more continuous type of data with these mass spectrometers, but uh, it's a slower process and it uses up a lot of, of computer memory. So, Typical um, uh, spectra are obtained at unit mass positions. So just like with FTIR, let's discuss the advantages and the disadvantages of mass spectrometry. So again, mass spectrometry is a continuous method. We have spectra that are collected at each point in time during your TGA experiment. On average, it has higher sensitivity than IR spectroscopy. So you then uh, can use less sample typically uh, in a mass spec experiment than you will in an infrared experiment. Uh, of course, you measure uh, non-IR absorbing gases. All uh, molecular species can be ionized, so there really is no, no set of molecules that will enter the mass spectrometer which will not be ionized to some level and detected. Um, and in general, it has a little bit more rapid response than, than uh, infrared spectrometry. The reason for this is that the ionization of the gases must occur uh, under high vacuum. So the mass spectrometers, as opposed to the infrared spectrometers, have pumps built into them. And so when we, we this transfer line which is connecting the, um, the TGA to the mass spectrometer then gases, because there's a, there's a vacuum that's created in the, um, in the mass spectrometer, gases are drawn down the, or, or they're actively drawn down the heated transfer line. And so in some cases this means that you will see a more rapid response in the mass spectrometer. It's not uncommon to, with the infrared spectrometers, you can put something like a peristaltic pump uh, on the output of the infrared spectrometer to also assist in drawing the gases. Uh, into the infrared spectrometer. One disadvantage here is that you cannot distinguish between molecules that have similar unit masses. So we talked a moment ago about carbon monoxide. It has a unit mass of 28, again, because the most common isotope of carbon is 12 to a unit mass, and for oxygen it's 16, so together those make 28. Nitrogen also is going to be 28, because nitrogen, uh, atomic nitrogen, uh, is at 14, so molecular nitrogen will be at 28. So if you're ionizing both of these gases at the same time in the spectrometer, they're going to both contribute to the ion current at 28, and you're not going to be able to distinguish between them. So this is typically why a lot of mass spectrometer experiments are run with helium as the inert purge gas and not nitrogen, uh, because with helium being at mass to charge 4, 
uh, you push it way down in the spectrum where it doesn't interfere with a lot of the gases that you want to analyze. Now, TA Instruments, we sell the Discovery mass spectrometer. Um, the hardware of it is exactly like I've described. It's a benchtop uh, quadrupole unit, um, and it has a, a range of from 1 to 300 uh, AMU, and that's very common uh, for benchtop mass spectrometers. Um, and it has a dual detector system within it. So the data that comes from a TGA uh, mass spec uh, experiment, uh, we've already seen that there is this, uh, this plot of relative uh, ion current intensity versus mass to charge ratio, and that's called a bar chart scan. Uh, typically, this type of scan is done initially when you're running a sample and you really don't know what you might be looking for, and you want to see which ions are the most prevalent here. And so typically, you'll run a scan covering the entire range of AMU, 1 to 300. And from that piece of data, then you're going to look at what are the most important uh, um, ions uh, to look at. And then you might then uh, um, uh, set up what's called a peak jump scan, where you just focus on those specific ions. And then you'll be plotting basically uh, ion current intensity versus time. And we'll show a plot of that in a moment. Now, at the bottom here, we have a reference spectrum for toluene from the NIST library. So the NIST library is the go-to library that is used by mass spectrometers, uh, mass spectrometrists. Uh, they, um, uh, this library is, is one that is used by people all around the world. Um, and it is based upon the ionization of species using 70 electron volt electrons. So that's why I emphasized previously that typically 70 electron volts is the most common kinetic energy given to the ionizing electrons uh, within the mass spectrometer. It's because you want to be able to match the, the spectra within the library of the NIST library. So this is a, spe this is a reference spectrum for toluene. And we would see that in this case, we would, if we're going to run a peak jump scan, if we wanted to detect toluene, we're probably going to be looking at mass to charge ratios of 91, 65, and 39 if we were going to run, a, a, as I said, if we want to run a peak jump scan. So again, we're going to look at the polyphenolin oxide here, just a reminder of what this data looks like in terms of the weight loss and the derivative of weight loss. And so here is a bar chart scan. This uh, scan was run from 50 AMU up to 200 AMU. And you can see the peaks that, uh, that are coming off of the sample. And this spectrum was collected, again, at the peak in the, the, uh, uh, the derivative, so where the, the maximum rate of weight loss is occurring in the sample. So again, we can take this data. Uh, and in this case, we can attempt at first uh, pass to associate uh, various fragments of the polyphenylene oxide with various uh, peaks that we see in the ion current density, as shown here. And again, this would tell us if we're going to be looking, uh, if we're going to then go to a peak jump scan, this would tell us particular peaks that we, uh, or ion currents that we want to, um, that we want to focus on. We can also do a library search for this. So this is now coming from the NIST library. So the, the raw spectrum has been loaded into the software which runs the NIST library. And at the top, we have the raw data that's presented to it. At the very bottom, we have the library spectrum. And in the middle, we have a comparison between these two spectra, a, a kind of head to tail comparison between the spectra to really give you a, a visual idea of how good the match is. Now, interestingly enough, the top match that's given by the NIST spectrum, uh, the NIST library, is 2,6-dimethylphenol. This is exactly the same match that was made by the infrared library. So they're both giving the same match to, to the spectra that are presented to them. But just like in the IR spectrum uh, example, we can look at this and we can see that there are still peaks within the raw mass spectrum data, which are not uh, uh, matched up with a corresponding peak in the NIST library. 
Um, a good example is the peak at 136. There's a fairly decent amount of ion current uh, at that mass to charge ratio, um, and 2,6-dimethylphenol does not have a um, does not have uh, a peak in that in that area. So again, just like with the IR spectral data, this is telling us that we likely don't just have pure 2,6-dimethylphenol coming into the spectrometer, but we have a mixture of gases here. And we're showing here, of course, now the peak jump scan. So this is, uh, we're looking at the, the masses that were tracked here when setting up the, uh, the, the software within the mass spectrometer. The masses that were, were tracked are 136, 121, 107, 91, 77, and 65. And those we got from the bar chart scan that we took previously. And you can see in this case how this data is being overlaid within TRIOS. So yes, this type of data, both the bar chart type scans and the peak jump type scans can be brought directly into TRIOS and then used to, to overlay with um, the TGA data. So now let's move on to gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So we already understand the mass spectrometry part here. So what about the gas chromatography part? Well, there is, uh, within the, the, the chromatography part, there's an activated column that the gases are injected into first. And it has what's called a stationary phase coated along the interior of the column. So the idea here in chromatography is that if you inject a gas into the column, which is multiple gas species, and I'm indicating different gas species here by blue squares, green triangles, and red circles. We hope that some of the chemical species have a greater affinity for the stationary phase in the column than other species. And so what this will allow is that these species, as they move down the column, will become separated from one another. And so when they finally exit the column and are injected into the mass spectrometer, it's one chemical species at a time that goes into the mass spectrometer. So if the parameters are set correctly and if the column chemistry is correct and you get good separation, obviously GCMS is a very powerful technique because it removes this, this possibility of getting spectra of, of multiple components at the same time. So you get two pieces of data then from a GCMS experiment. You get the mass spectrometry data, of course, which is shown as the, in the lower plot here, but you also get a gas chromatogram, and that's shown in the upper plot here. And the gas chromatogram is very similar to the Gram-Schmidt plot uh, in, that is produced by an IR spectrometer. Remember, that was a plot of total IR signal versus time. In this case, what the, the chromatogram is telling us is total ion current signal versus time. So we hope that each peak here is actually associated with a particular chemical species. And the, the idea behind getting good gas chromatograph data is you want to get as much separation between the various peaks that you see as possible, uh, because those are the species that they're then going to enter into the mass spectrometer. So advantages and disadvantages of GCMS. Advantages, of course, are this chemical separation. You, if the chemical separation is successful, you will get the most uh, complete chemical analysis of the gases coming into the spectrometer uh, that you can get. Um, it's also easy library searching that usually the, um, the, 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 it's very easy to send the data from the, uh, the, the, the uh, mass spectrometer directly into the the NIST library uh, for searching and matching. Um, and the disadvantage has already been alluded to previously, it, that it's typically time consuming. So you have to pick uh, a certain point in time in which you want to have gases sampled. Uh, and so then uh, they have to make their way down the column. And this, is, this takes time for the gases to move through the column. So this is why this is, is a non-continuous type of process. Uh, because uh, it can take anywhere from a half hour to longer to get these gases through the column. Um, so this is a, not a continuous method. So again, we're going to look at the polyphenolin oxide, and we are going to, again, 
um, we're going to sample the gases right at the point where there's the maximum rate of weight loss occurring in the sample. And this is the chromatogram that is, that is obtained. Now, once the gases, once we have the, the, the GCMS instrument sample a little bit of gas, um, we then, the, the, the column itself is essentially inside of an oven, and we'll ramp the temperature of that oven from some initial temperature to some final temperature at some linear rate. In this case, we're going from 50 to 250 Celsius at a rate of 10 C per minute. This also helps to promote separation of gases and to move them efficiently through the column. And from the data that's shown here, we see that we get two clusters of chromatograph peaks. There's a cluster that is occurring uh, certainly between uh, 7 and 10 minutes and a cluster that's occurring between 19 and 22 minutes. So let's analyze each of these clusters separately. Uh, but first, before we do that, we're going to look at a library search here. The sizes of the peaks can be used to give some indication of relative abundance. Since this is a plot of, since the chromatogram is a plot of total ion current, then the tallest peaks are the peaks that are supplying you the most ions from the gas substance that's coming into the mass spectrometer. So that would mean that essentially you have more of that uh, particular chemical species than other chemical species. Um, so we're going to look at what the mass spectrometer uh, library search looks like for the tallest peak, which is the peak that's occurring right after about eight minutes in this plot. If we do that, and this should look very familiar to, the, to you because this, um, uh, this looks like the, the library search that was done previously on just the straight mass spectrometer data, we see that once again 2,6-dimethylphenol is the best match to that peak. And in this case, the match is actually excellent, showing that we have separated the 2,6-dimethylphenol from any of the other chemical species that are in there, and it's entering the mass spectrometer as a single chemical species and analyzes a single chemical species. So this actually tells us that the library searches that were done by the IR instrument and by the standalone mass spectrometer instrument, those standalone instruments, they actually were pretty decent. They gave us the best match to the material that made up the majority of the, um, of the, the chemical species entering into the system. Uh, uh, but of course, they were not able to give us a complete match because they were not able to, to break down what the other components might be. But we can do that with the GCMS. So it turns out that the first cluster is a set of methyl phenols. So we have, and these are single ring structures with methyl groups hanging off the ends of them. So the peak on the far left is just 2-methylphenol. And then we have a set of 3-dimethylphenols, which have 2-methyl groups uh, hanging off the ring structure. And we again see that, that the tallest peak here, I've labeled that as the peak that is the 2,6-dimethylphenol. And then we have a trimethylphenol, which is for the peak on the far right. The other cluster of data is actually a set of double ring structures. Now, I'm not going to attempt to say the names of these particular double, uh, uh, double uh, ring structures because they're very long and I'll trip over myself if I try to, to say them. But suffice it to say that, that each of these peaks here in the chromatogram uh, are, is associated with a double ring structure. So the GCMS instrument then is telling us that as the polyphenolin oxide is run in the TGA, it breaks down primarily into 2,6-dimethylphenol, uh, but it also breaks down into other single ring structures and then a set of double ring structures. So again, this is a single weight loss event. It's perfect for doing GCMS on, and it gives us the complete chemical information uh, for this particular experiment. Uh, to, to finish up, Let's talk about multiple hyphenation. And by multiple hyphenation, I mean the ability to attach uh, a couple of different uh, instruments uh, to, the, um, to the TGA. In this image right here, we show uh, the TGA uh, connected by a heated transfer line to an FTIR, which then has a heated transfer line that is connecting it to a GCMS system. So, of course, we've talked about when you have the TGA, you have the ability to, to have the standalone spectrometers. 
So working from the left, you have the ability to put a, a standalone FTIR spectrometer onto the TGA or a standalone mass spectrometer onto the TGA. Uh, TA Instruments also sells the hardware which allows you to connect both a standalone infrared spectrometer and a standalone mass spectrometer to one of our IR TGAs. So then in this case, uh, this would be a 5500 TGA or a Discovery 1 TGA or a Q5000 IR TGA. We have the hardware which allows you to attach both types of spectrometers simultaneously to these units. Um, and of course, you know, with the GCMS, you're getting the gas chromatograph data and the mass spectrometry data. But if you have the setup that we showed in the previous slide, you then have the ability to get FTIR data along with the GCMS data. In fact, you can get the full range of data shown here. With the setup that was shown in the previous slide, if you want to, you can bypass the activated column in the GC. You can send the gas directly through to the mass spec itself, and you can just get mass spec data if you want to. You can certainly just get infrared data if you want to. You don't have, you don't have to send gas into the GCMS system. You can do GCMS by itself, or you can do FTIR GCMS. And of course, since all of these techniques tend to complement one another, uh, they will give you, th this type of setup gives you very complete chemical information uh, coming from your samples. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've shown that hyphenating a spectrometer uh, to a TGA allows for the, uh, the chemical uh, identification of gases coming out of a TGA and that this can be helpful in, in many instances to, to know this. Um, multiple hyphenation can allow for perhaps a more complete set of data that can be used to study systems uh, under investigation in your TGA. And um, TGA with their horizontal flow, uh, TA instruments, um, TGAs with their horizontal flow or their SDTs with their horizontal flow uh, of gases through them uh, is going to provide the superior TGA data to, to link up to the data that comes from these spectrometers. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, I want to thank everyone for their attendance to the webinar today. Um, we've reached the question and answer session. Um, I'd like to first off say that um, uh, we do have too many questions to, to go through in, in this session. So if we don't get to your question, uh, rest assured we will get to it um, to you personally. Um, so first off, we have a, a, a question here that says, um, uh, my question is about test conditions. So of course, the test conditions you have potentially a number of instruments here, um, the TGA, the FTIR, the mass spec, um, to, to think about what your test conditions would be. So let's, let's talk about the TGA first. Um, in terms of size of sample, um, typically we would start off with uh, a sample on the small side, um, especially if you're running uh, mass spec as your hyphenated technique. Uh, this would be just to reduce the possibility of clogging the, um, uh, the uh, the, the capillary. Uh, so typical TGA mass sizes are about 10 milligrams. So um, uh, about one milligram, um, if you're doing hyphenated a TGA mass spec, would be a, a, a better place to start. And then increase sample size as, as necessary. Um, for FTIR, uh, 10 milligrams, 5 to 10 milligrams is still uh, probably okay. Uh, capillaries there are much bigger, so no, no real chance of clogging them. Um, 10 degrees a minute is still a reasonable, um, a reasonable scan rate for your TGA. Uh, you don't want to do any isothermals uh, around the, the weight loss events, um, so this would mean that you really wouldn't, wouldn't want to run a high res. Uh, that's because um, if you if you go into an isothermal mode around um, a weight loss event, that just spreads out over time uh, the gas is coming off of the sample. Uh, you'd rather actually have a nice slug that's very um, compacted in time, so to speak, uh, make its way down the, uh, the transfer line. So typical scan rates, 10, 20 degrees a minute, um, are fine for, um, 
for the TGA. And sample pan choice really doesn't come into play here. Depend, just depends upon what what um, what upper temperature you're going to. Um, as far as the mass spec goes, um, there is a control for um, uh, the scan speed, uh, and and so you can can have the uh, mass spec scan through the the the, the mass to charge uh, species either very quickly or very slowly. Um, if it scans very quickly, um, you increase the amount of noise um, in your signal. If you scan slower, um, you will um, uh, decrease the amount of noise. Uh, but you also, uh, obviously scanning slower, um, you may impact how many scans you get during a particular weight loss event. So this may entail that you, you might want to do a, a, a scouting scan first, look at the weight losses you have, plot it. If you're running at 10 degrees a minute, then plot it on a time scale, see how long your, uh, how, how long in time your weight losses uh, occur, and then adjust your, your mass spec scan speed uh, to a rate um, which would get you, you know, two or three different, uh, two or three full scans um, through a, a weight loss. And that same kind of consideration also is involved uh, with the FTIR. Um, okay, so there's there's another question here that says, is there a way in TRIOS to set a minimum value for the ion current? So, of course, um, uh, the data from the mass spec and from the FTIR can be imported into TRIOS and plotted. And so, sure, once you plot the, um, the mass spec data in TRIOS, which is typically plotted as, as ion current um, uh, versus, um, versus time or, or temperature, um, sure, you can, you can set a minimum value. Uh, the way to do that within TRIOS would be to right-click on the, um, uh, the y-axis, the ion current axis, um, and choose scaling. And that way you can go in and manually set a lower level. Um, uh, here at TA, one of the, the uh, person uh, that runs the, uh, the system uh, quite frequently has always sets a lower limit of about 10 to the minus 4 um, uh, amps on that, uh, on that axis. So the answer to that is yes, and you can get that through the scaling option um, in, in Treehouse. Okay, so there's another uh, question. Um, it says, when analyzing an unknown sample, what sort of thought processes do you go through to select a particular hyphenated technique? Uh, here at TA, we, we have, um, uh, we're, we're in a good situation. We have all of the various hyphenated techniques. So we don't really think about, you know, uh, restricting ourselves to, to analyzing a sample in one technique. Um, uh, if, you know, if we have enough sample, then we're going to use uh, all the techniques available to us. And I guess that would be really where um, uh, some consideration would come in. If you, if you have a very tiny amount of sample um, and you have a choice of running it on the mass spec or the FTIR, you would probably choose to run it on the mass spec uh, just because uh, lower amounts of samples can still be analyzed fairly fairly easily on the um, uh, on the mass spec, uh, whereas you need typically you need a little bit larger amounts of sample. So one milligram or less of sample still will give you a fairly good mass spec uh, uh, signal, whereas that might not be the case for the FTIR. So if you if you do have a small amount of sample, you have less than a milligram of sample, um, and you have a choice between mass spec and FTIR, then mass spec is the way to go. But if you have plenty of sample and you have um, you have uh, both techniques available to you, um, uh, or GCMS uh, for that matter, uh, run it on as many techniques as you have. There's no need. Each one will give you some insight uh, into the, the material that you're analyzing and, and the gases that come off. So there's no need to restrict yourself on that. Uh, okay, uh, there's another question here that says, I want to attach uh, my TGA uh, to my thermo FTIR. Who does the connection? 
Okay, so this, the, the way that this question is phrased, uh, it sounds as though uh, this person already has a TGA and, a, and an FTIR, but let me, let me go through a, a number of different scenarios here, I guess, if I could. So if you do already have um, the TGA and the FTIR, then it, it, um, uh, you as the customer can, can do the connection. Um, it's not difficult. Uh, it, it, it depends upon the TGA you have. You may need to purchase a um, an interface kit from us. So if you have a um, um, if you have one of our um, IR TGAs, um, there is a a we do sell a kit which um, gives you a specific hardware uh, which can be attached to the TGA um, and provides you a heated interface um, and. Um, so you could actually have your service rep come in and and put that on, but it's actually fairly straightforward too. It's it's something that a customer could do. Um, and then once that's on, it's absolutely straightforward how to connect the FTIR. Most FTIR uh, heated interfaces end in a um, in a uh, swage lock connection, a female swage lock connection, and the um, and the furnace on the TGA is going to have a male swage lock connection, so you just attach them uh, that way. Um, typically, uh, just one note here: you would typically, um, um, typically, uh, just one note here: you would typically um, uh, turn the nut finger tight, and then probably about one quarter turn past that. Um, there's no need to um, really crank on these types of swage lock connections. And you do um, run the risk of of cracking um, the um, uh, the quartz liner on on some of these TGAs if you turn too hard. Um, so typical for swage lock connections is finger tighten and a quarter turn past that. Now, if you have the EGA furnace, um, again that already has a one eighth inch connection um, on the furnace. So it, again, then it's just it's just screw the um, uh, the the heated transfer line onto the onto the furnace. Now, because that's not a heated connection, um, you may need to some depending upon the type of sample that you're running and whether um, it likes to condense if the if it sees a cold spot, you may have to put, apply some some type of heater wrap or heater tape around the connection uh, to make sure that you um, uh, that you uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, TA doesn't supply that. That's something that you can purchase um, through some uh, uh, through a company, probably like Fisher or someone like that, um, and they can, uh, and then you can wrap that around the connection and um, and heat that connection. But that's not necessary on uh, on all systems. Again, it depends upon upon what you're looking at. If you have gases that like to stay in the vapor phase, um, even if they see you know something close, I guess to to um, uh, uh, a room temperature, then um, there's no need to, to do something like that. Now, if you if you don't already have the units, then um, when you if you purchase a TGA and an FTIR, then our guy will come in and install the TGA, and then the um, service rep from Thermo will come in and install the um, the FTIR. And typically during their installation, they will then make the uh, the connection onto the the TGA.